Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the historic Pythian Theater for the 12th annual Legends and Legacies. At this time, we would like for you to welcome to the stage, Mr. Jerry Revish. Thank you. Good evening, good evening. What a great, exciting time we will have tonight. He's left the stage, but if you were in the room, didn't you appreciate the pianist tonight, Otis Davenport? Give him a round of applause. This room has so much history and so much music history in it that it was just wonderful to hear him play. Good evening, I'm Jerry Revish of WBNS 10 TV, and it's my great honor to be a part of this great program tonight, Legends and Legacies. It's my third consecutive year, and every year is different, every year is unique, every year is wonderful. On behalf of the King Arts Complex, Board of Trustees, staff, and volunteers, we would like to thank all of you for joining us for the 12th annual Legends and Legacies Awards Ceremony in the historic Pythian Theater that'll celebrate its 93rd anniversary on January 10, 2019. Yeah, a round of applause for this great building. So much has happened here over the decades. Legends and Legacies recognizes the rich and diverse contributions of individuals who have shown their commitment to human rights, artistic excellence, and service. Their actions have influenced and impacted their community, city, state, and nation through philanthropy, service, leadership, creativity, and vision. In commemoration of the 50th year since the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the King Arts Complex is honoring his legacy. Tonight, we honor three distinguished men whose lives work exemplifies the dream. Guy Cole, Algernon Marbley, and Alex Shoemate are the personification of Dr. King's teachings, not only in their careers, but in the manner in which they have paid forward to assist others and their life careers. All three men were motivated to continue Dr. King's legacy after his assassination in 1968, and they have done so in remarkable fashion. Judge Cole hails from Birmingham, Alabama, where in his youth, he crossed paths with Dr. King. Judge Marbley was raised in rural North Carolina in the small community of Nashville, where separate meant unequal. Alex Shoemate was born in DeKalb, Mississippi, and his family was part of the Great Migration North, in their case, to Ohio. Each of these men have made significant contributions to the city, state, and nation by ensuring that civil rights be enjoyed by all. As the evening goes on tonight, you will learn more about their storied careers, and it'll become quite obvious why they were selected as the 2018 Legends and Legacies honorees. Dr. King spoke these words with regard to excellence. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. I think it's safe to say tonight's honorees exemplify these words, and they are inspiring others to serve as they lead by example. Next, please join me in welcoming to the stage Ms. Olivia Johnson, Chairwoman of the King Arts Complex Board of Trustees. Let's give her a round of applause. Good evening. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the King Arts Complex, welcome to the 12th Annual Legends and Legacies Award Ceremony. At this time, I would like for all of the board members of the King Arts Complex, would you please stand? Thank you. Tonight, we are delighted to honor the Honorable Guy R. Cole, the Honorable Anginon L. Marbley, and Alex Shoemate Esquire. We honor them for their outstanding contributions to civil rights and for continuing Dr. King's legacy of justice for all. 
We also thank them for their ongoing contributions to the King Arts Complex. Before we begin our recognition these, of these three distinguished honorees, we wish to thank our sponsors. First, please join me in thanking our honorary co-chairs, Brenda and Michael Drake. Would you please stand? Lori Barreras and Alex Fisher, please stand. We also thank the entire Legis Legends and Legacies host committee, whose names are listed in the program, and they are scrolling on the screen behind me. Will all host committee members please stand and be recognized. Thank you very much. We appreciate all that you do for the King Arts Complex. We also want to acknowledge and thank our corporate sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Wexner Family Charitable Fund, our Legends and Legacies Host Committee, Platinum Sponsors AEP, Honda, L Brands, and the Ohio State University. Our diamond sponsors, Cavelli Enterprises, Park National Bank, Voris, Sater, Seymour, and Pease. For all of these wonderful sponsors with their representatives, please stand and be acknowledged. Thank you very much. In addition, we have a host of gold sponsors and individuals who have supported tonight's event that are listed in the program and were recognized on a rolling screen as you were being seated. Please join me again in welcoming all of these wonderful sponsors. Next, we acknowledge all elected officials who are in attendance tonight. Would all elected officials please stand and be recognized? Thank you. We thank you for supporting the arts and thank you for being here with us on this momentous occasion. Now, please welcome back to the stage, Jerry Revis. Thank you, Olivia. Before we bring our honorees and moderator to the stage, I want to direct your attention to the screen here. There are some people who'd like to recognize our honorees as well. Let's take a look. Guy Cole, Judge Marbley, and Alex Shoemate. These are giants. Hard work commitment, dreams can come true. I mean, so the first time I tried a lawsuit in this courtroom, he held me in contempt. So, I'm going, man, really? I've been a judge for 22 years, and for 21 of those years, I've worked across the hall from Monty Marbley, as he's known to me, judged to a lot of the other people here. I would say the day he started here was the best day of my professional career. I think in Guy's case, uh, there was a feeling as he was growing up in the 60s and the 70s that lawyers could make a difference, uh, they could change things. I remember the strategic Alex. The Alex that would call you on the telephone and say, let's go to lunch and talk about a problem. How do we solve the issues for African Americans? How do we make a difference? Things get uh, in any way uh, challenging. Alex is the guy you turn to. You, you know people like Alex, that they're hardworking uh, from someplace within themselves, that they are always on, always doing the work, always pushing it forward. And, 
I think um, he's that way because he doesn't know any other way to be. When I think of celebrating not only legends and legacy, but thinking of Martin Luther King Jr. and his life and all the things that he did, and now here we are 50 years later. I think that Martin Luther King would say, thanks for having an Alex Shoemate in the room. There are uh, people out there in the world now, we know them, we are among them, who really work hard to try to uh, move things forward in the world. I mean, and that's really what we do, that's what we're about, and Alex is definitely one of those people. He created a model, really, under his leadership, a model of how university boards operate, a national model. That's the caliber of work that Alex Shumate um, offers this community. I've known Judge Marbley since I've been a lawyer, probably sometime in the early 80s. Well, I think I go back to the, t uh, the day we had lunch and he decided he was going to pursue the federal judgeship. I think that desire of fairness, of the opportunity to serve the public, and to give back to his community. I think if you go all the way back to his college years, uh, that he has been a fighter for justice. He has a very strong sense of right and wrong, and I think he sees this position as one where it's his job to bring justice about. And I think that's, that's a great motivator. That's what makes him a wonderful public servant. He is a rarity. I mean, obviously sitting over here uh, as uh, a federal district court judge with a lifetime appointment. But I think the work he's done with the KIPP program, he, you know, he controls an audience. He has a personality, he has a character, and he has a sense of humor. And he doesn't take himself too seriously. I think even though the judge uh, really wanted to pursue that judgeship, he never wanted to give up uh, his commitment back to the community. And he's done that for his entire tenure. I was in the White House one day talking with the president. And I said I uh, was thinking of uh, taking senior status and creating a vacancy on the Sixth Circuit. And they said, well, you know, give, me, give us a list of names. I had my list, and the list was Guy Cole. Guy is a, a person that I guess I would describe as understated. People are, are drawn to him, but that does not mean he doesn't have very strong beliefs. There is a paramount emphasis on getting it right, being right, applying the law properly. He insists that uh, uh, every person or entity that appears in his court be treated with respect and very courteously. Uh, and I think that really uh, is the epitome of, uh, of, of who, Guy Cole, uh, who Guy Cole really is. And I, I watched his career. I was very impressed with him. He was a, I could see he was a, he was a mover. He was a person on the rise. He was young, he was bright. When he was appointed to his seat on the Court of Appeals, I think he was the 18th African American in our history to uh, be appointed to, the, to a circuit court. What I can say to y'all is, if he is half the man his grandpappy was, he'll make a fine, fine judge. And with that, the hearing concluded. <laughs>Three of those uh, gentlemen really paved the way for those that came afterwards. They really helped transform a profession uh, on a national level, but their real impact was, was, was in central Ohio. Judge Marbley's golf scores leave a lot to be desired. He does, he's not perfect, he's close. Uh, but I think we'll just leave it there, the rest of it has to be off the record. I think we need to have more Alex Shoemakes in our communities, in our corporate structure. I believe we've not seen the end of the work that Alex Shoemate will be doing. He's just been such a wonderful friend, colleague. We've grown old together, I tell people. He had a lot of hair when he started, I did too. Those days are long gone. But we have shared all sorts of things together, cases, family issues, deaths, births, 
weddings. Uh, we've, we've really had a wonderful 21 year stretch together and hopefully a lot more to come. At this point in my young life, it's hard to uh, think that I know legends and legends who leave legacies. Uh, but uh, two, two of you are very special friends, uh, Alex and Monty, and both of you are deserving for every recognition in the community. Clearly in Columbus, Ohio, uh, both of you are legends, and both of you, the legacy that you're building in terms of the lives you live, the contributions to the community you make are just outstanding. So it's a pleasure, truly a pleasure, to congratulate you this evening. These three individuals are excellent examples of what the fight that Martin Luther King and others uh, put forth to demonstrate that, that the African American community was as capable as any in, uh, in addressing the needs of our, of our country. A guy and Monty and Alex all made a contribution that was similar uh, to moving those, to moving our institutions forward in a very positive way. Didn't you enjoy that? You heard tonight. What I think those testimonies we just witnessed make it quite clear for honoring these three gentlemen. They are etching their journeys onto the pages of history. At this time, we introduce our 2018 Legends and Legacies honorees. Please welcome to the stage Judge R. Guy Cole, Chief Judge, U.S. Court of Appeals of the Sixth Circuit. <laughs> judge Algernon Marbley, U.S. District Judge for the Southern District of Ohio. Alex Shoemate, Esquire, Managing Partner, North America, Squire, Patton Boggs. <laughs> O.H. I just wanted to make sure I was in the right room. And our moderator for tonight's fireside chat is Mrs. Abigail Wexner. She's a lawyer and community volunteer involved in philanthropic work nationally and locally with a particular focus on children's issues. <laughs> Mrs. Wexner is the CEO of White Barn Associates. She is founding board member and vice chair of the board for KIPP Columbus and serves, <laughs> all right, and serves on a number of boards, including the Ohio State University Nationwide Children's Hospital. Please welcome her now. Thank you, Jerry. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Before we begin tonight's conversation, I just want to express how honored I am to have been asked to join you this evening, um, and tr how truly humbled I am to sit among these three gentlemen, these venerable leaders of our community, truly these giants, as you have clearly seen, um, and as who, who we recognize. I've had the great privilege over the last 25 years to work very closely on community projects with Alex and with Monty, and I've admired Judge Cole from afar, not too far. Um, and I know really firsthand the tremendous leadership that you three exercise, uh, the fresh paths that you have forged, your deep commitment to justice and to this community, and perhaps most importantly, the truth and the generosity of your hearts. So through our conversation tonight, I hope that you all get to know them just a little bit better and that you will be, as I have been, uh, inspired by their work and by their journeys uh, and just by their character. So I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about your formative years um, and examine then how you've thought about career and service and civil rights. 
So Alex, we're going to get started with you. Um, as Jerry me mentioned, uh, you were born in DeKalb, Mississippi, um, and your family was part of the Great Migration North, landing here in Ohio. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience meant to you and your family? Sure. For me, it represents uh, opportunity. Uh, my parents were born in Mississippi, and uh, my father and my mother decided that they wanted to make a better life for my sister and myself at the time. And so they were part of the Great Migration, and I know we've talked about the, uh, the book that talks about the warmth of other sons being the uh, real migration of families like my family that really wanted to provide a better life for their children. So for me, the move was very positive in terms of, I've often thought about how fortunate for me that I was raised in an integrated environment as opposed to a segregated environment. And that was particularly driven home because during the summers when I was growing up, we would travel back to Mississippi from Ohio and to see that difference once you cross the Mason-Dixon line was just a reminder of how fortunate I was mm -hmm. to have the opportunities for education and for employment as well as the social activities that I think laid a great foundation for my life. So I'm very thankful. Great. Interesting that they all came from the South uh, and landed in Ohio. And Monty, I know you spent your formative years in North Carolina. Um, separate was not equal. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like? Uh, certainly. Um, it, it's somewhat defined um, my growing up, but I had a, a great family. Uh, and just as it, the other families who grew up in the segregated South, uh, they taught us survival skills. Uh, how to deal with education, how to look at problems, and instead of just suffering through them, to rectify them. So I think that as you know, we talked about uh, uh, today earlier, we talked about uh, discrimination and we talked about civil rights and the like. Well, I was uniquely prepared to deal with it because we knew that there was something terribly wrong with the system of Jim Crow. And so the emphasis was on how to dismantle it. And I think that my parents, at least, and my family emphasized it through education. You can grow to overcome that. And that's kind of consistent with Dr. King's uh, message. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the, the emphasis was always on uh, surviving, doing the best that you can, building character. And, you know, I grew up in such a close-knit uh, neighborhood that the effects of discrimination were more insidious. They weren't openly apparent, but they had a, a, a lasting effect. And it's the kind of thing that we all said as growing up, um, we are not going to allow this to persist, and we are not going to allow this to define our destiny. And you know, if you go back to Nashville and uh, most of the people that you know, we grew up with who made that sort of commitment to themselves, you'll see that those young men and young women have done well uh, because we uh, insisted that our demographics wouldn't equal our destiny. And Guy, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. I imagine in Birmingham, Alabama, in that treacherous time, uh, the discrimination was probably a bit more evident. I think that, that that's a, a very accurate to, to say, mm -hmm. Abigail. So I was born in uh, Birmingham, Alabama in the early 1950s, 1951, so I'm gonna date myself at this time. <laughs> and I lived there through uh, sixth grade. And Birmingham, of today is a modern welcoming city but back in the late 40s and 1950s and 1960s it was not if you were uh, black so uh, Birmingham was a gritty uh, hard-nosed steel town often called the Pittsburgh uh, of the South and um, 
it really was a uh, a challenging environment for any any black family. I, I remember as a child, uh, my parents taking me shopping downtown, for example, at the downtown uh, department stores. We were not allowed to try clothes on, even though we were expected to pay money for them. Uh, if you needed to use the restroom, the restrooms were marked colored um, and white. And the same for the very nice water fountain that was marked uh, white and the very old uh, water fountain that was marked uh, colored. Uh, Birmingham developed uh, a reputation uh, for uh, really terrorism against uh, black citizens. And they, one of its nicknames was Bombingham. And so I live in an area that came to be known as Dynamite Hill. And it's called Dynamite Hill because uh, black families began to move up on this hill and purchase houses across Center Street, was, which was the demarcation line. Blacks were not supposed to move to the west side of Center Street. So, and, and then you had some uh, black civil rights leaders who were beginning to build houses up in that area. So the area was targeted by the Klan for bombing. And the, uh, the bomb of choice was dynamite, and dynamite would be uh, thrown at the, at the door or placed under a window uh, of you know, people who lived up on Dynamite Hill. We had cracks in our house from a bomb blasts that had gone off uh, maybe a block away. Arthur Shores was one of the most well-known uh, black lawyers in Birmingham at that time, and his house was bombed at least seven times according to documented records. So his family actually put uh, tall chests and cabinets against the front windows and door to, to, uh, to try to you know, stifle, hold back any sort of blast. Uh, I will say this though, even though Birmingham was uh, segregated in every way that you can imagine, the school I attended, uh, which had all black teachers, was one where we were provided an excellent education by an all black uh, educational staff. And I think, you know, my colleagues here have talk, talked about hope. Well, even in that environment, we had hope as children, and we were made to feel, uh, have worth and, and value. And so um, I have to, you know, really give a lot of credit to those brave teachers uh, who were so committed to us and parents in the neighborhood who were likewise uh, committed. Now, Monty and I have talked at times about, you know, we had the oldest books. You know, they didn't have covers on them, we didn't have enough supplies, but we had, you know, support and love and commitment from, from our teachers. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to ask you, it's my impression that um, in terms of successful people, there's usually at least one person in your life who inspires you or challenges you in some very formative way. Alex, who's that, who's that person, who was that person in your life? For me, it was my father, mm -hmm. in terms of um, he was a, a person who only went to the eighth grade. And so part of his dream was to uh, have all of us, my brother, my sister, and I all go to college, not just graduate from, from high school. And so what he instilled was what I call the value of hard work. Mm -hmm. He was a hard worker, and when he moved from the uh, working in the farms in Mississippi to working in the auto industry in Sandusky, he always emphasized the importance of hard work and said to me, you can do anything mm -hmm. if you're willing to work hard. And the other thing in terms of, of my father is that he instilled confidence that it was so important for him to make sure that um, all of us had confidence and believe that we could accomplish things and that indeed we could be successful if we were willing to work hard. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, Monty, who's, who is that person? Well, for me, it took a village, Abigail. <laughs> uh, and, 
And, and, and it was a three-headed village. It was my mother, who's here tonight, my father, and my grandmother. And, uh, my mother uh, uh, singularly instilled tenacity in me. But again, that's a black mother's instinct raising a black son in the South. So she, she made me strong. There was no question about Can that. Can we hear a thanks for mom? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and the irony is that my father was a college athlete, but it was my mother who was tenacious and competitive, and she instilled that in me. My father had a, had a great sense of compassion, uh, and he, he gave that to me, and he gave me his time and affection. But my grandmother gave me wisdom and, and uh, judgment. Um, but there were certain constants among all of the messages. And there, there were two, well, obviously, they loved me, but our parents loved Saul. That, 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 was, that was not unusual. But what they gave me was a sense of self-confidence because they always told me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. I was always made to believe that there was no task too formidable uh, for me to conquer, and if you hear, if that's the message every day, yeah. then you begin to believe it, and it can uh, enable you to weather many a storm. And you know, as a as a judge, as an African American male, you know, uh, growing up in this society, those were uh, traits that mm -hmm. enabled me to sustain myself. Right. And Guy, I've read a little bit about your relationship to your to your father. Is that who you would have said? Yeah, I would actually say you know both parents. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, uh, my father would be uh, you know one one of the two. He uh, was also a native of Birmingham. Uh, went off to Fisk University at the age of fifteen. And graduated from Meharry Medical College at the age of eighteen. Uh, graduated medical school at the age of 21. Wow. So we, um, he, my mother went to Fisk as well a little bit later, and he decided to return to Birmingham to establish uh, his medical practice, a family medical practice. And my father had what I would call quiet strength. And he was you know, humble, um, but strong. And just uh, always that father who was there for you. Uh, my last two and a half years of high school, I went to uh, school about 20 miles outside of uh, New Haven, and I was on the baseball team. And he would come, uh, without telling me, I just look out in the you know, stands and he would be there, even though most of my time was spent on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's dedication. So you got used to. That's dedication. <laughs> <laughs> so he got to watch me. I was clean. I never got dirty. Uh, but 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 I would also add in there my mother. Uh, uh, some of you attended my mother's uh, memorial service, and uh, Reverend Aaron's, my minister, described her as the original tiger mom. And I think that that is a very good mm -hmm. statement. She was outspoken, passionate about things. Um, and had the most uh, a deep and abiding commitment to the education of her children. She thought, if they don't have anything else in this world, they will have an education. So she was the one in um, 1962, as my father was building his medical practice, who said, uh, Ramsey, guess what? We're moving north. And my dad was, well, that's really not what I want to do. And my mother was, said essentially, it doesn't matter what you want to do because we are going. And they picked New Haven, Connecticut because it was a model city. But you know, I, I learned a lot from them and I, in terms of raising my kids, Kathy and me. Uh, and I you know, saw the, 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 the sacrifice they made for us to go to these good colleges. And, you know, we, Kathy and I did the same thing with our kids, and I learned a lot from my parents. So I would say both of my parents. Great. 
Um, so I know in my case, the decision to go to law school was purely a practical one. I needed to get a job, and I needed to have a career, and I needed to support myself. Um, Alex, was the law calling for you? For, for me, the law was the fulfillment of a dream. I mean, I talked a little bit about uh, those summer trips to uh, Mississippi. And what was interesting was the difference that I experienced after the passage of the civil rights laws. Mm -hmm. And that had such a profound you know, impact on me that before, very overtly, once you crossed into the South, the, the white only signs, but that afterwards there was change. It wasn't necessarily as significant as the promise of the laws, but I experienced the fact that the law could have a very positive, constructive change. And that's really why I went into uh, the Attorney General's office because I started as a civil rights trial lawyer. Right. Most people don't realize that. Right. But uh, that was my calling, if you will, mm -hmm. that I wanted to use the law to be an effective vehicle for positive change. Great. And, and Monty, was it a calling for you? It was in part because I, I know this comes as a shock to you. To you. We, <laughs> we worked together so many years, but I, I like to talk <laughs> back then. But that was back then. And so I figured, that's, that, 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 I figured that that's something that I could do and to do well. But then as I matured in the late 60s, coming of age in Nashville, North Carolina, I wanted to right those wrongs. And I saw the law as a vehicle for social change, and I never wavered uh, from that. So it was something that I felt that I could do and could do reasonably well. I believe that I had the skill set for it. But more importantly, I had the passion for it, and I saw the law as a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. Guy, um, after graduating from Tufts, you attended Yale Law School, and uh, we've been hearing a lot about what's gone on <laughs> at Yale Law School these last few days. <laughs> but I won't go there. I'd just like to ask you, what, what was that climate like at Yale for you in the 1970s? So I started law school in 1972. And this was on the heels of the assassinations in 1968 of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and, and Robert F. Kennedy. And two years before I started law school, you had the um, shooting up at Kent State where four students lost their, their lives. So as I entered law school, those events were still sort of percolating, but I'd say the burning issue was the Vietnam War. And uh, for those of you who were not around at that, that point, by 1972, I think it's fair to say much of the country had soured on the war and felt that it was you know, unwinnable. So for young law students, it was quite, uh, quite an issue. And so that seemed to be the, the issue of the day. A couple of other things happened during my time in law school that were pretty significant uh, events. Watergate uh, occurred. So it was 1972 when the burglars uh, uh, went into the Watergate complex. And it was in 1974, uh, August, that the president uh, resigned. So I was, I was in law school. So that was a much debated uh, uh, topic. Uh, Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973. And that was a very much a, a hot issue while I was in, in law school. So I would say my class of uh, students, I'm sure it's true of Alex's as well, because we graduated um, college and went into law school at the same time, uh, went into a law school environment that was animated by social activism. The belief that you could use the law to effect social change, that certainly protests were one way to, 
to work on change, uh, but that using the legal system uh, to effect change would be the more permanent uh, way to do that. So that was one thing that really uh, got a lot of us all charged up while I was in law school. Great, great. So um, Monty and Alex, I, I know that immediately after law school, actually both of you went directly into public service. Alex, is, as you just mentioned, in the Attorney General's Office, Civil Rights Division, and Monty, you served five years uh, as Assistant General Counsel in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So what, what was that? What was that decision on both your parts to go into public service first? Um, I believed in public service. I believed in the mission of the agency. If you grew up in the South uh, with Mr. Crow, Jim Crow, then uh, one of the things that <clears throat> you understood was that the federal government would uh, you know, be the instrument of change. It wasn't going to be state or local governments. And so, you know, it was a natural transition for me to go from a small private firm at which I worked immediately out of law school and spend the five years at the, US, in the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, issues of health, uh, in my view, was a, a prominent civil rights issue at the time, and the agency charged with uh, promulgating rules and regulations around those issues was HHS, and I thought that that was a good way uh, to make a difference. I learned a lot. I got a chance to try some interesting cases, and so it was time well spent. And uh, I think that experience whetted my appetite for continued public service, which yep. is what the Chief and I do right now. Okay. And now, Alex? Similar for me in that, uh, again, um, the opportunity to be a civil rights trial lawyer with my family's background, trips to the South, seeing the impact of uh, integration, and having the Ohio Civil Rights Commission as my, my first client was just the, the real draw for me to come to Columbus and I'm very thankful that uh, the Attorney General's office provided that opportunity. Like Monty said, you had to get started right away. You didn't have associates, you didn't have legal assistance. And so I tried my first case within six weeks and uh, it was just a great experience traveling the state. Wow, great. Um, and Guy, as I understand it, you were a successful partner already sitting in a prestigious law firm when you get a call to a judgeship uh, from President Clinton's administration. What is that moment like? I, I would love to know that. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first call, as Judge Jones indicated, was from him. So I had been a bankruptcy judge. I've been a partner at, at Voorhees, had uh, left to be a bankruptcy judge for six years, and had returned to, to the firm in the beginning of 1993 with the absolute firm commitment to stay there the rest of my life. I really wanted to continue uh, my career to whatever point at, at Voorhees. Eight months after I unpacked my boxes at Voorhees, I got a call from Judge Jones. And Judge Jones said, hey, guy, he said, uh, how you doing? I said, I'm, just, I'm mm -hmm. doing fine. Uh, he said, I'm thinking about taking senior status, which opens up a seat on the Sixth Circuit. Um, been talking to a lot of people, would you be interested? I said, I appreciate the call, I was flattered. I said, I appreciate the call, Judge Jones, but no. I just uh, returned to the law firm. I don't want to chase a position that I probably won't get. I don't have any real political you know, background, so uh, I think I'll just take a pass. Maybe something will come up uh, later on. But Nate, as you could probably tell from the video, is not one to say, to take no or to retreat. So he just put the worm on the line and cast it out there, and this got me to nibble more and more as he you know, drew the lure in. And he would just call me from time to time and talk to me about it. And he talked about uh, terms of a calling. And I really hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, being a judge was something that somewhat lurked in my mind a bit uh, that's why I went down to the bankruptcy court. And as with Monty and Alex, coming from the South, 
And I just really thought being a judge would give me an opportunity to, to, to effect change. You know, I, I, I had a lot of exposure as a child, really, to young civil rights lawyers who would gather uh, at you know different houses, a social basis, and they would you know have a good time, but they would also talk about the law. And I think that that really inculcated some thinking about it. And I, and I must say that uh, just some of what I saw in terms of um, the, the lack of justice in, in Birmingham always kind of resonated with me. Uh, as you probably know, you know, two of the girls who died in the 16th Street um, bombing uh, were, were friends, and one was my next door neighbor. Yeah. And so I never really forgot that. And I always thought, you know, I do have some responsibility uh, to have an impact on society. Now, I also thought about remaining a partner of the law firm, and, you know, there's a financial reward there, hopefully. <laughs> But I, I, I really had a greater commitment, and, and I thought about it more and more, and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna pursue this nomination. I may or may not get it, but um, I think it's worth the pursuit. Thank you. So each of you has had to be a first. The first African American to hold the office of Chief, Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court. The first African American Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit the first African-American to hold uh, the managing partner's role at a major law firm, Squire Patton Boggs, here in Columbus, uh, and so on and so on. You've, been the, you've held many firsts. What, what does that mean? What, what responsibility and, and what, in a sense, burden does that carry? Alex, you want to start? I remember uh, Bob Duncan. Uh, saying to me one time, Judge Duncan said, uh, it's, it's nice to be first, but it's important not to be the last. And what he meant by that was, it's nice to be first, but handle your business in such a way that you're going to create opportunities for others. So again, to me, it's an opportunity but it's an opportunity to lay a foundation for others to take advantage of those similar kinds of uh, positions. Monty? Um, I, I, I sincerely believe that I hold this office in trust for the next person who comes behind me. And um, I want the office I want to conduct my affairs in the office in such a manner that the office will be held in the same high regard when I exit as it was when I entered. Uh, but I don't want to have unrealistic expectations. It was uh, uh, a gentleman came to me uh, when President Obama was elected, and, and he said, "Well." You, you must be elated. And, and I said, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have, since 1972, voted for uh, candidates who, who didn't look like me, and I thought it was a natural order of things. So I'm not elated because Barack Obama is black. I'm, relate, I'm elated because he was the best candidate. And so I want to be judged because I was the best a district court judge next to my brother, Judge Sargas. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, but, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to be uh, the best black judge or uh, anything like that. I am proud to be uh, in September of 19, uh, 2019 to become the first black chief judge, but uh, I'm, I think that I'm more proud of what my judicial record has been, quite frankly. Nice. Bye. Well, you know, it, um, you, you get called the first you know, black this and first black that regularly, and it, it certainly does 
uh, have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, it has meaning in that you have reached whatever that position is by standing on the shoulders of others. You didn't get there on your own. There are others who did a lot to pave the way. So I'm never so uh, arrogant as to believe that I just did all of this on my own. I did this with the help of a lot of uh, other people. I have the same reaction as, as uh, Alex and Monty in terms of the moniker first just kind of following you around. I would much rather be known for many, many other things. It's fine that I'm the, you know, the first you know, black partner at Voorhees, the first you know, black chief judge in the Sixth Circuit, but I'd rather be viewed one day as the best chief judge in the Sixth Circuit and the best judge on the circuit. And, and by that, I mean the fairest. You know, the one who put the Constitution and the law and the rights of others above all else. And that's what it really is Im important to me. But it also gives me a chance to be at the table. At, before, uh, mm -hmm. I was not. Now, I, I'm in, I spend a great deal of my time as chief judge traveling representing the Sixth Circuit at one uh, event or another. And so I'm in Washington, D.C., and I you know, have mm -hmm. breakfast regularly with the Chief Justice and the other Chief Circuit judges. It is important to be a part of you know, that, uh, those kinds of gatherings. And, but I do view it as a sacred responsibility. I mean, my, I look to give, give back, and I try to do that in the Columbus community in many ways. Great. So I'm going to have to think on my feet. I'm getting signs from Jerry already, and I'm not halfway through the questions that I had. <laughs> Two so. questions I, I really wanted to ask. Um, we sit here in the King Arts Complex, and, and obviously we're mindful of the 50th anniversary of the tragic passing of Dr. King. Where are we as a country on civil rights? Where are we after Charlottesville? You've got to talk fast. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would, I would say this, Abigail. Um, you know, if Dr. King were here today, I think he would say that we have made a great deal of progress. Mm -hmm. But I think he'd also say there is much left to be done. And I think that in the uh, areas of you know, housing, poverty uh, in this country, edu education, uh, these are all matters where, where we still have so much more work. So yes, we have made progress, but we have a long way to go. As for Charlottesville, that's just a very sad, tragic, awful chapter in, in this country's history, um, you know, caused by one group of people, not by you know, multiple groups of people. I, 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 I you get agree. my drift. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with, uh, with the chief, but I think that we are a house divided. And I think that if the leadership uh, were erudite and, and they would read the words of Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, uh, describing how a house divided will fall. And, and, and I think that Charlottesville arose in the vacuum of a lack of national leadership. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to, to put it in, in my view. Uh, when you don't come out and condemn mm -hmm. what has happened, then you enable persons who have long since remain fringe elements. And you, you can dress it up as you wish. You can call it alt-right, but it's not alt-right. I grew up with, with those folks. It is, when you, when, when you describe it as alt-right, it becomes somehow benign. Mm -hmm. But when you describe it for what it is, it's, it's racism at its worst. Yeah. Then it's not so benign, and, and once you, as, as judges, once we define an issue, we can address it. Yep. And if you avoid the issue, you never address it. And so 
These are difficult decisions that have to be made, that must be made, because those folks are on the wrong side of history, and those folks are in the they they are in the way of the inevitable evolution of humanity. Okay, Alex, don't ask that, but just to Alex, what, what's the single most important, or the single biggest challenge uh, in the area of civil rights facing the African American community today? One of the things I see is, you look around this room and everyone's doing well. But even in our community, there's a big divide. And the 80-20 rule is, is active. And I think what we need to do is to be very, very careful not to think that there's been too much progress made and we need to take some steps to make sure that we're bringing up everyone and not just having the 20% be what people see. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to have to skip over the questions on community service, which we're going to be uh, very illustrative. Um, and just ask you one final question. Are they going to seat Judge Kavanaugh? <laughs> I, I'm not sure if the judges can speak on that, oh, they right? Can, they, can, they can render an opinion. <laughs> I'll say unfortunately. I'll say that the greatest problem facing the black community oh, 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 oh. <laughs> is disenfranchisement and uh, you know uh, measures that have been undertaken to uh, burden burden the franchise and that all roads inevitably lead back to the lack of uh, exercising a voice and when you don't exercise your voice, then you get Kavanaugh or and the like. I, I, I agree with Monty uh, completely. I, I think that uh, as we've done a lot of work in the area of education, but I think education, in my view, is the single most important factor. Uh, if you get an education, no one can ever take that away from you and I think that it is uh, I, I just mentioned to uh, Abigail I went out and talked to ninth grade students at the, the KIPP school I can't because tell you some of them back there ah, there maybe I met some of you <laughs> and I was just uh, blown away at the poise and the, 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 the knowledge and interest and curiosity of these students that we should see that in every school in Columbus and across the, the country. So I think it's education, but I would also agree, I, I'm gonna make my last pitch, is voting. We have to vote. And so if you, so if you, you know, elections have consequences. That's and right. if you Thank don't you. vote, then, you know, you don't have much room to complain. So um, I just urge everybody to vote and I think educating young kids early to begin voting is important. So thank you three so much for being so open and honest about your thoughts and your feelings and clearly I hope you got to know them a little bit better and understand a little bit better why they are held in such love and such great respect. Thank you. Uh, thank you. What a great interview tonight. Let's give our moderator a round of applause. Abigail Wexler. Masterful job tonight. We almost got a little breaking news out of that, too. We ask our honorees to remain on the stage now until the program has ended. Again, we thank you so much, Abigail, for giving us your time tonight. Our next guests to join us on stage are our honorary co-chairs. Please give a round of applause for Alex Fisher, Gloria Barreras, Brenda Drake, and Michael Drake.
So Lori and I are just absolutely honored to join the Drakes in this fantastic celebration of uh, legends and legacies and to learn and reflect this evening uh, to take in the wisdom uh, and all the thoughts we all uh, are appreciative of the uh, amazing service of uh, these three wonderful individuals. It is my distinct pleasure to present the 2018 Legends and Legacy Award to the Honorable Guy Cole. <laughs> Chief Judge Cole understood the law's power and potential to achieve justice as a young man, as we heard growing up in Birmingham, Alabama. He was the personal witness to civil rights activists who sacrificed everything to obtain civil rights guaranteed by the Constitution. He was inspired by those he saw leading, inspired to go to the Yale Law School, inspired to join the Voorhees Law Firm, becoming one of its first black partners, the first partner of a major law firm in Ohio. But as we learned more than first, He's a man of humility. He's a man of wisdom that rivals any of his peers of any color. In 1995, Judge Cole was nominated by President Clinton to the Sixth Circuit, where he currently serves as the Chief Judge. He lifts up others through his mentoring. Uh, he has former law clerks, which number more than 80 former law clerks, which spread his wisdom and reach uh, throughout not only our state, but our country. He is fair, he puts law above all else, and as he said, he's at the table and in the room making a difference in our community and in our state uh, and in our country. So let me read the inscription of this beautiful award. Thank you, Chief Judge Cole, for becoming the first African American to hold the position of Chief Judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit since the court's formation in 1869. Your landmark decisions on civil rights, criminal procedure, and the scope of the First Amendment are indeed testaments to the principles of equality and justice for all. Well, good evening again. Um, I'm honored to accept this award and humbled by your presence and support this evening. I'm also proud to share this honor with these two fine gentlemen. Thanks to all of you who made this evening possible. Dimitris Neely and her dedicated staff here at the King Arts Complex, the board of the complex, the chairs and members of the host committee, all of you very generous sponsors, our master of ceremonies, Jerry Revish, and of course, Abigail Wexner, who moderated with the usual uh, distinction and excellence that uh, we knew uh, she would display. And a special thanks, if I could, to Sheila Smith, who just did uh, yeoman's work in getting so much of this organized. Thank you, Sheila. I'd like to thank Judge Nathaniel Jones and my former law partners, Russ Gertmanian and Fred Rancier from the Voice Firm for their touching video presentations. I am forever grateful to Judge Jones for encouraging me to pursue the nomination in 1995 for his seat on the United States Court of Appeals. Russ and our dear friend George Corey and George's wife, George Ann, who are here today, and George Ann is, were instrumental in me ending up in Columbus and at the Voice Firm and have been friends for many years. Fred Rancier has been a close friend for the entirety of my time in Columbus and I truly appreciate our friendship. I'd be remiss if I did not thank the 95 or so law clerks who have been with me throughout my years on the court and some of whom are here uh, tonight. Would you stand up for a moment, uh, law clerks? Yeah. 
I consider them part of my family, and I'm so very proud of each and every one of them. The same holds true for my assistants, Angela Van and Diane, Diane Stash, who hopefully will stand. <laughs> Diane joined me four years ago when I became chief judge, and she, she has seen it in a shorter span of time. And last, but certainly not least, thank you to my family, my wife, Kathy, is here in the front row. Kathy's been by my side for 35 years. I'd uh, like to thank my children now grown, Justin, Jordan, and Alex. But special thanks go to our almost six-year-old granddaughter, Peyton, who is far and away the most popular member of the Cole family at this time. And of course, I want to thank the Corey family. They're really an extended family of the Cole family. Uh, who have been so close over the years. And so, jo George Ann and Michael, would you stand, please? <laughs> All of these people have made my life infinitely better. It's hard to believe that this year marks the 50th anniversary of the death of Dr. King. Dr. Com King was committed to what the great civil rights leader and congressman John Lewis likes to call that good trouble. And it was that good trouble by Dr. King that moved our nation toward equality and justice for all. A few years ago, more than 30 members of the Columbus and Ohio State communities commemorated Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail by each reading selected passages. That jail is not far from where I lived in Birmingham. I was one of those readers, as were my two co-honorees, as was Dr. Drake, and many others in this audience. And the reading was memorialized in the video. You may recall that there is an off-sided passage from Dr. King's letter that reads, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This is an important message for all of us today and certainly for me as I grapple with the most challenging issues of our day. But in today's hyperpartisan climate, we would do well to remember the two sentences that follow that iconic phrase. Dr. King wrote, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. That has never been truer than today. So on this 50th anniversary of Dr. King's death, we celebrate his life and legacy in the civil and human rights arenas. As a native of Birmingham, Alabama, one who witnessed segregation at its worst, I embrace Dr. King's exhortation that, quote, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Again, congratulations to my dear friends, Monty and Alex, and thanks again, Abigail, and Jerry and all of you who have joined us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. An extra war, Lori Barreras. Thank you and welcome everyone. I'm excited to uh, present the 2018 Legends and Legacy Award to Judge Alger Algernon Marbley. We call him, we all call him Monty. Monty is a good friend of Alex and I and we're honored to be part of this wonderful evening in recognition of Monty's storied career. All of us who know Monty know he can, his big gift is his ability to turn a phrase. In fact, the Washington Post has, uh, has stolen uh, and used his a motto that he came up with. It is democracy dies in the darkness. We are also proud that Judge Marbley will become Chief Judge of the Southern District of Ohio. Again, another first, but he's also the best. And I'd like to read uh, his, his... That's a better picture than the one we used earlier. <laughs> It's a more current. Thank you, Judge Marbley, for serving as a U.S. District Judge, a member of the Ohio State University Board of Trustees, Nationwide Children's Hospital Board of Trustees, 
chairman of the KIPP Columbus Charter School. Yay, KIPP. And a professor of law at the Moritz College of Law and Harvard Law School. Your service to others is truly an inspiration to all. Thank you, Judge Marbley. Thank you. <clears throat> My friend Archie, who's over there, uh, has a line about the three Bs, be brief, brother, be brief. And, 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 and so, <laughs> I, but I want to uh, ditto what my chief uh, said. I would like to thank uh, Demetrius, the board of the King Arts Complex, um, the host committee, of course, who comprise of many of my friends. Uh, I'd like to thank Abigail for agreeing to moderate this, this panel. Um, I'd like to thank my dear friend Sheila Smith for being a, a force behind getting uh, this done uh, along with Dimitri uh, on time and under budget. <laughs> um, more importantly, I, I want to thank my family. My mom is here, Ann Johnson, my uh, oldest son, my namesake, Algernon. The most important people in my life, my three uh, granddaughters, uh, where is Corinne? Oh, there they are. Corinne, Carmen, and Camille. Would you all, would the three of you stand, please? Uh, thank you, oldest son. Uh, Aaron was not able to uh, attend tonight because he's working. Uh, in New York, um, but it's important uh, that uh, my, my family and uh, many of my friends uh, came, my law clerks came, uh, and in the, I, I got to put in a plug for them in the program, you'll see a big picture of me with all of my clerks. We had my 20th anniversary and, and most of them uh, came back and there are a number of them in the audience. So. Would you all please stand? In fact, one of my clerks is now, uh, Alicia Bros, is now on the board of the uh, King Arts Complex. So, uh, you know, I, I must have trained her particularly well. <clears throat> uh, I, I want to note that I'm humbled by being here with you know, my best friend for 25 years, we were law partners together. My great friend, Alex, who was a confederate of mine at Ohio State and a, and a mentor at Ohio State as we uh, went through the process together and tried to make the great state university greater. And we couldn't have gotten any better when we hired Michael Drake. The, the final observation that I, that I want to make is that, you know, I'm, I'm honored to have, have had the opportunity to serve this community as a federal judge for two reasons. One is because public service is a calling, is, is the highest calling, certainly I believe, in our profession. And as a friend of mine once told me, public service is the rent that you pay for life on this earth. And secondly, I, 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 um, I'm honored to have had the opportunity to serve as a federal judge because the constitutional power with which I am clothed is only useful in its expenditure. And each time that I don my robe, I am committed to using my constitutional power both wisely and fairly. At least so I think. Thank you very much. And our next award presented by Michael and Brenda Drake. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. Very nice actually to see everyone here uh, this evening. And really your stories were similar in, in so many ways that were profound and meaningful. The importance of family, the importance of mentorship, the importance of knowing you had an opportunity, the importance of people who sponsored you through that 
opportunity and, and the importance of not forgetting those people along the way. It's really been quite, quite inspiring. We are honored to present the King Arch Complex this 2018 Legends and Legacies Award to our dear friend Alex Shoemate. Alex is widely recognized as among Columbus's most influential leaders. And importantly, he has opened doors and provided opportunity for others on his journey to the top. He is a true champion of diversity, both in the legal profession and in other ways throughout our community and across our country. He elevates the quality of any enterprise lucky enough to receive his time and attention. He was one of the first people we met in Columbus, and we hold him in the highest esteem. And please now welcome my wife, Brenda. Thank you. I have the pleasure of reading the plaque that we will present to Alex, whom we dearly love. Alex. To Alex Shoemate. Thank you for your extraordinary leadership in the legal community and for your service to the Ohio State University Board of Trustees. Thank you for your time, treasure, and commitment to the arts and the Columbus community. You have set a high standard for others to emulate. Congratulations, Alex. Demetrius told me at the beginning that by the time I got up, our time would be over. <laughs> but I do want to just take a couple minutes to say thank you. Uh, thank you first to the King Arts Complex and the board for this great honor and to share this honor with two truly outstanding individuals who are inspiring persons for all of us and um, the way they articulated their stories this evening is one that I will always remember so it's an honor to share this with you. Also want to thank Sheila Smith and part of the reason that all three of us are thanking Sheila is because Sheila is one of those persons who doesn't seek the limelight but I can guarantee she's the one who really worked hard behind the scenes with Demetrius, with the host committee, with the board to make this happen. So let's give Sheila a great round of applause. And I certainly want to uh, thank my wife Renee for all of her support and her birthday is Saturday. So I wanna wish her a happy birthday and this is the party that we threw for you. <laughs> also want to thank my mother-in-law who is here. It's nice to have a mother-in-law who likes you. <laughs> and I really appreciate my mother-in-law being here and so thankful to our law firm for their support and so thankful to this great community. When I looked at the host committee and the support that uh, we have for this event tonight, it, it says something about our community that there truly is a Columbus way. And I'm very proud to be part of the Columbus way. And let's continue to work together so that we indeed make sure that we fulfill Dr. King's dream. Thank you very much. Alex Shoemate, Algernon Marbley, Guy Cole, 2018 Legends and Legacies honorees tonight. How wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to draw your attention to the screen. We have a few more congratulatory messages for you. Congratulations, Guy, Monty, and Alex. Three giants in the legal profession being celebrated as legends and legacy. Welcome to the Legends and Legacy uh, 
group of people that have been celebrated over the years. You so deserve this great honor. I'm proud of each and every one of you, and I consider each of you my friend. Thank you. Monty, congratulations. You are truly an urban statesman. Monty, congratulations. We are so happy to know you and to have you in our community and in the state of Ohio. Thank you for all you do, you're the best. When I think of each of you, and I'm actually doing this collectively, but each of you bring these words to mind. Um, decent, distinguished, difference makers. So congratulations, thrilled to have you as friends and colleagues and difference makers in our community. Alex, congratulations. Monty, congratulations. I couldn't be more proud to know you, to be your friend, and to be here tonight to celebrate with you. These individuals are so very deserving, and our community is better for them. Congratulations. Alex, tonight is your night. Congratulations. I'm so proud of you. You've earned this award and joining two other of your colleagues as this year's recipients of Legend and Legacy. Let me just say, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve this message. Judge Marbley, you are a fantastic human being, a better judge. I think he deserves uh, not only this honor, every honor he has uh, received and the ones he will continue to receive for his outstanding lifetime of achievement and commitment to people in general from all walks of life. This is a wonderful time to honor a wonderful person. I'm delighted to be part of it. Uh, judge Cole, Congratulations, this is well-deserved, earned, uh, and maybe even late. So this, this is a court that uh, has impacted history. Uh, it's a court that covers Ohio, Michigan, Tennessee, and Kentucky. That's an awful lot of real estate, a lot of people, and Judge Guy is now serving as the Chief Judge, and I certainly wish him well as he carries out those duties. It's a profound privilege. Uh, and indeed, I'm fortunate to have this, uh, have had the opportunity over the past 44 years uh, to call you my friend. Uh, I want to thank you for everything you've done, and I look forward to continuing our relationship uh, as it has been over the past 44 years. Thank you again. Alex, congratulations on this wonderful honor. You and your fellow honorees have devoted your lives to furthering Dr. King's legacy. Yes, Alex, congratulations. And on behalf of all Buckeyes, thank you for your service and dedication to our community. Columbus is a better place because of you and the lives you have touched. Go, Go Bucks. Bucks. I want to offer my heartfelt congratulations to all three honorees of the 2018 Legends and Legacies. Judge Cole, we are so glad that your journey led you to Columbus. We have benefited greatly from your commitment to the people, from your work on the bench, to your time in the classroom at Ohio State, in your unrelenting service through boards and committees too numerous to list. Judge Marbley, your devotion to the importance of voting rights has shaped the state and the country. We're grateful for your service, both on the bench and in the community. And Alex, Columbus is known for its collaborative spirit, and you are the embodiment of collaboration. Thank you for always being open to innovation and teamwork, not only in your professional work, but in your community commitments as well. Alex, Monty, Guy, I just want to congratulate you. Uh, unbelievable recognition uh, that you're receiving tonight and it's well deserved. Uh, what a great honor and I'm just blessed that I have this opportunity to, to share a few words of congratulations. Thank you so much for your unbelievable service uh, to our community, to the state of Ohio, and, and frankly, uh, to all the great people who have passed uh, your lives. Uh, you've impacted so many people positively, and uh, we would not have the opportunity to have so many things happening in our communities and in our society were it not for your commitment to people. Uh, you've been impacted so many in so many different ways. So thank you for that. But I personally want to thank you for your friendship. Uh, there's a lot of stories I could share right now about each of you, but I'll leave that alone, uh, especially our most recent experience uh, with Kevin Hart, uh, with Guy and Monty. I'll, I'll leave that alone. 
Uh, but uh, I mean, Alex are, are great trips to, to, to Napa and, and Italy and other places. So, but thank you so much for your friendship. Congratulations on your great recognition. Well deserved. You guys are the best. You're the best. And uh, a lot of years ahead of us. Uh, so thank you for your great work. Go Bucks. I want to thank the co-chairs. I want to thank Abigail Wexner. I want to thank our volunteers. I want to thank the honorees and their families and their staff. They were amazing to work with. I'm sure I'm leaving a group or an individual out, but there were so many people that put this together. We are about six, seven, eight people work here in the executive team. There's no way we could have done this by ourselves. So thank you all. Please give yourself a round of applause for putting, helping us put this together. The mayor is right, it's the Columbus way. We do everything through collaboration. Having said that, I do wanna to report to you that we tonight, we gave, there was a pre-event uh, pre reception and the honorees are all wearing kente. Kente stoles are worn during a time of great importance in African tradition. And tonight, we honored the chief judge of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. We honored the soon-to-be chief judge of the District Court, Southern District of Ohio. And we honored the managing partner, Squire Patton Boggs in North America, one of the largest law firms in the world. I would say this was an important night. So that's why we gave them the Kente. We also gave them a brick paver. That is part, going to be part of our permanent installation. This is a brick paver that's in our Walk of Fame with information about them and their um, accomplishments. They also received a plaque directly outside the wall. To the left is our wall of legends. We have a lot of legends in this room, that, the previous legends. There's probably about a dozen of them. And they are all on that, have plaques on that wall. And now these lovely gentlemen do as well. And we did something unique this year. We do something unique every year for legends that we have not done for any other legend, specific to you. And so this year we adorn the outside of our building with three flags honoring each of the legends. If you didn't see them coming in, it's beautiful. I hope you take a chance, take a moment to look at them. The last thing I'll say is this event is a record setting, history making. We raised money for this event to, to support our youth education and our programming for our seniors. This year we raised nearly $200,000. That's So thank you all for that. That's, uh, as I said, a record. So thank you all for that. With that, I would like to turn the program back over to um, our master ceremony, Jerry Ravish. He's the best, isn't he? Give Jerry a hand. Thank you, thank you Jerry. Thank you. Take us home, Jerry. Give her a round of applause for pulling this together tonight. What a great job. What a great job. As we close out this evening, we invite you to exit the front side doors. Follow Cargo and Gory Island to the music of Andrew Waters. The artwork of international artist Tali Bamazi, who was the artist of the amazing portraits right here in this theater. They're on display in the Dream Corridor. Enjoy yourselves at the reception, featuring music from the Otis Davenport Trio. And if you're leaving us for the night, be safe as you travel home this evening. Thank you for coming. God bless you and have a great night.